Okay, hello and welcome back. And today's video will be on the Texas Chief, which was the Santa Fe's premier train between Chicago and Texas. And um, let's get right into the outline for today's video. We will be going over the history and backstory of how the Santa Fe made it to Texas, as long as the, as well as the secondary trains that ran the route, which were the Tulsa and the Chicago and Kansas City, and before we jump into the Texas Chief itself and um, the Amtrak era. So as I, I keep doing this outline at the beginning of all videos, yes, I will be talking about the Texas Chief and various other trains that ran the route, but I will, and I'll be talking about the construction of the route. So we're going a whole comprehensive history, not just uh, the Texas Chief in the picture right here. So let's get into the construction of the route. And I'll just explain a little bit about the map. The red line is the route of the Texas Chief, approximately, between Chicago and Galveston, which, is what is its, which was its original terminus. And the yellow line is the Tulsa, which ran from Kansas City to Tulsa, Oklahoma. The route started out as the Gulf Coast and Santa Fe Railroad, which was the Texas subsidiary of the Santa Fe. And it was originally chartered to by the state of Texas at the behest of the people of Galveston to connect to the outside world without needing to send anything through Houston. Back then, Galveston was the state capital, but Houston and its health authorities would do a very un-Texan thing, um, which was embargoing goods due to disease outbreaks. Um, for historical context, it was very common in the late 1800s for diseases such as yellow fever to come in on ships to port cities and quarantines would be established to try to limit the spread of diseases. The Gulf Coast and Santa Fe was chartered to connect Galveston to Santa Fe, New Mexico, and avoiding Houston. This railway was originally planned to connect to the Rio Grande instead of the Santa Fe that eventually came to own it. And also, just as a sake of a clarification, at this point in time, the uh, Santa Fe proper didn't actually own the railroad. It was called the Gulf Coast and Santa Fe because it was going to go to Santa Fe, New Mexico. Just as a clarification there, I don't know if I exactly made that as clear as I should have. Construction of the Gulf Coast and Santa Fe started in 1875, and in 10 years would grow to a thousand mile system that would extend as far as Dallas and some of the towns around it. But the railroad was financially unstable and it wasn't long before they started shopping around for buyers. Around this time is when the Santa Fe had finished its connection to California, but the gro gro growth of the Gulf Coast and Santa Fe, which I'm just going to call the Gulf Coast for any further reference, it didn't go unnoticed by Jay Good, the railroad owner and robber baron who had a monopoly in Texas at the time, through the Missouri Pacific. In the early part of the 1880s, the Santa Fe under William Barso Strong had broken the SP monopoly in Southern California, and there were plans to break their hold in Northern California as well, but we'll get into that in a future video. The last thing he wanted, Good wanted at least, was um, the Santa Fe breaking his hold on Texas as well. At the time, the Missouri Pacific and its various subsidiaries were the only major railroads in Texas at the time, and the Gulf Coast was the Frankly, I think as far as I can tell, the only major railroad that wasn't in his orbit yet. <clears throat> and in 1885, the Santa Fe and the Gulf Coast came to an agreement. The Santa Fe would take it over and make it into a subsidiary, but it would have to build a 111-mile connection between Dallas and Purcell, Oklahoma. This was a hard ask, but they did manage to complete it in a few other stipulations. And this led to the Gulf Coast and Santa Fe becoming a part of the Santa Fe Railway. And um, as mentioned in the previous video, this is due to Texas having a law saying that every um, railroad operating in Texas at the time had to have a Texas-based like subsidiary. Or Well, that was the outcome. It mandated that every railway operating in Texas be headquartered there, which is, again, they just had subsidiaries because of uh, inconsistent regulations at the time. And at this moment, G. Goods' monopoly in Texas was broken. And as mentioned in previous videos, uh, other railroads eventually made it to Texas. The Southern Pacific built its own route into Texas using the Texas and New Orleans Railroad between El Paso and New Orleans. 
the CB and Q um, eventually got a connection from Denver to Fort Worth, as well as the Rock Island and CB and Q um, having a joint line between Dallas and Houston. So this was just the uh, first round of, uh, well, monopoly do- breaking that, um, well, eventually led to the well, sort of modern railway scene. So we're going to talk briefly, <clears throat> and by briefly, I mean really briefly, about, um, you know, the heavyweight trains that ran between Chicago and Texas prior to the Chief and the other named trains on the route. But as mentioned in basically every video for I don't even know how long, the sad thing is that there really isn't too much um, recorded about the trains that predate whatever the main or even secondary name trains on the route um, were called. Other than this, the predecessor to the Texas Chief being called the Chicago Express, I don't really know too much about it or like when it started running, what it, you know, what it carried. But it was most likely a heavyweight Pullman train, similar to the one in picture. Yeah, this is a lot newer because of the um, diesel switch engine here, but and the you know streamlined cars in the background. But as is a uh, tradition on this channel, you know, there's not too much of a recorded history of what existed before the streamline era. So other than knowing that um, trains ran along these routes before the famous ones, um, you know, since they carried mail and they were the only effective long distance transportation at the time, at least over land, um, they existed, but not too sure about what the exact history was of them. Before we get into the Texas Chief itself, I'm going to talk about the secondary trains that ran between Chicago and Texas on the Santa Fe. The first one we're going to talk about is the Tulson. The Tulson was one of the various Santa Fe regional trains that, while significantly less famous than the Chiefs, were still top-tier trains in the U.S. at the time. The Tulson was launched in 1938 with lightweight butt equipment, as seen in the picture. And it made one round trip per day between Tulsa and Kansas City. This train had a baggage car, two chair cars, and an observation car that included that continued to Chicago on the Chicagoan, and a 36 seat diner. This is similar to the Golden Gate train in California that ran between Oakland and Bakersfield with bus connections to Southern California, that I covered in the video about trains in the Central Valley. This train eventually faced cuts as well. <clears throat> it lost its full diner in 1949 which was replaced by a cafe car. And um, so by 1954, the diner and the lounge were gone, and it was just a cafe car. And in 1963, the um, train lost all food service. And in 1968, the connection <laughs> to Chicago was taken over by the Grand Canyon when the Chicago one was canceled. And then the Tolson limped on as a coach-only train until Amtrak was created in 1971 when it was not continued by Amtrak. So as you can see here, um, this is, I believe, a consist of from the, I think the 60s or maybe even the 50s. It normally had the, um, it's either an E or an F unit and then some number of uh, lightweight cars. It's fairly normal for the time. The other secondary train to run the route was the Chicagoan and Kansas Cityan. They were similar to the Tulson, which was that there were regional trains that connected the two namesake cities. These are also coach trains that ran with three coaches, a cafe car, a full diner, and a round-end observation car. This train was launched in 1938 when they started launching a lot of lightweight regional trains across the Santa Fe system. Eventually, this pair of trains was extended into Texas to support their services to the state. These trains were also started to support the streamliners that were running at the time, since passengers were the main way, trains were the main way to travel. At the time, the Santa Fe went to make sure it could sell seats for its cross-country trains to cross-country passengers. Um, not to mention that the other first-class trains were extra fare trains where you'd be charged an extra fee for riding the trains, and the regional trains generally were not extra fare trains. Nineteen fifty-five was the turning point for these trains as well. This is when they lost their full diner even though it was an overnight train between Chicago and Dallas by then. It also ran during daylight hours as far as Wichita, and the rest of the trip into Dallas was overnight. The train kept running until 1968 when it was canceled along with the Chief, the Golden Gate, and 
that year also saw the combination of the Super Chief and the El Capitan. At this point, the only secondary train running the route, at least between Chicago and Kansas City, was the Grand Canyon. And for a time, there also was an overnight train between Chicago and Kansas City, and this was the Kansas City Chief. This train was launched in 1951 to draw the overnight market between the two cities. Um, at the point at the point when it was launched, there was still the Super Chief, Chief, California Limited, or was it LA Limited, whichever, Navajo Scout, Grand Canyon, and I may have mixed a couple of them up, but the point was that they had a lot of cross-country service still running even in 1950, and the Santa Fe didn't want passengers just riding between Chicago and Kansas City to take up space for passengers going further west, so they launched an overtrain train to serve the market, and um, unlike Amtrak, because they had like, I think was it, like seven or eight trains running across country, they all didn't leave at the same time, so they were spaced out during the day. Um, that being said, again, they didn't want, you know, because I can't remember which train it was exactly, but one of them did leave later in the day to go to LA, uh, I think a little bit before or after the Kansas City Chief, I can't remember, I didn't look it up at the schedule or put it up in the notes, but basically they didn't want the like later night train that would be somewhat convenient for a Chicago Kansas City hop to be taken up by people who would just go between the two. So again, it was just extra capacity at this point. So before we get into the Amtrak era, we need to talk about the headline train, and this is the Texas Chief. The Texas Chief was launched in 1948, and was consequentially the last of the Santa Fe's fleet of chiefs to be launched, and it replaced the Chicago Express, which was the old train that ran the route. Despite running a more circuitous route compared to some of the competing trains between Chicago and Texas, it was one of the more patronized routes owing to the Santa Fe's commitment to running a first-rate train, even though patronage would have been declining you know, about a decade after it was launched. Like its sister, the San Francisco Chief, it was primarily supplied with secondhand equipment from other trains as they were upgraded. And the schedule for the train had the southbound train leaving in the evening and arriving in Galveston the next morning. And the northbound trip would leave Galveston in the morning and arrive the next morning. As the passenger trains faced declines, the connection to Dallas was eventually replaced with a bus um, out of Fort Worth, and it was eventually truncated to just Houston. It was also given spare equipment from the chief. At the time, it was canceled, which meant it got domes. Dining car service on the Texas chief um, was run by the Fred Harvey Company and was high quality for its entire existence. On the menu from the late 1950s that I am uh, should be on screen right now, they were still serving five entree options, including fish, steak, a chef's choice, which was a sandwich, an omelet, and grilled chicken. All these came with some sort of potato side, vegetables, and rolls, and the drink options were coffee, tea, and milk. And, um, yeah, just to give you a second to look at the screen before I kick it over to the next one, you know, pause it if you uh, want to really look at this in more detail. And on the, this would have been the first page, and the one I just showed was the second. Uh, on the first page, there's appetizers, which include soups. And the thing I'm, um, you know, there's also salads and sandwiches and desserts if you didn't want a full menu, a full meal. And the thing that I'm surprised about on the uh, menu is the pie and just the desserts in general. And, you know, I, I may have to make a video about the logistics of food service on a train someday, but anyways, even though this was a secondary train, and this was well into the point where patronage would have been declining. There, there was still a very robust uh, menu in the dining car for dinner. And for comparison, even first-year trains like the Empire Builder only topped out at four options for dinner. And at this point, four options was, um, I wouldn't say, I don't know if it was really the norm, but it was definitely like the norm if you still care about like your passenger trains or at least putting up a good image. Like four was the, um, like the max and this train was running five even as a secondary train. So the Texas Chief ran until the end of private passenger service in the United States, and it kept running for the first nine years of Amtrak's existence. So um, this is just a few uh, pictures of the, um, what's it called? Just images from the early days, or the later days of the 
Santa Fe service. The poster is the Chicago one and Kansas City one, which were the daily streamliners. And um, again, they supplemented the Texas Chief before they were inevitably canceled. And then the picture of the train is actually um, the Texas Chief under Amtrak's, um, what's it called, flag. Because you can see over here in the background, there, this is actually an Amtrak painted car. So this would have been probably like 72 or later. So yeah, as you can still see, Rainbow Era. So Santa Fe painted um, coaches. At least this first car here has um, the Amtrak colors and maybe the other ones have some Amtrak paint on the back. But again, this is like early days of Amtrak. But it kept running for the first nine years of existence, of Amtrak at least. And eventually the train was renamed the Lone Star at the Santa Fe's behest due to Amtrak's quote unquote substandard service quality. This train more or less ran the same route as the um, its predecessor service with Amtrak's level of service. And then there was a, br um, a brief point, there was a section to Dallas since Amtrak didn't want to fully reroute the train through Dallas. And unlike the original, Texas Chief the Lone Star didn't go as far as Galveston, as far as I can tell. And the train was eventually cut in 1979 due to the Carter cuts to Amtrak, which also took out the National Limited, the North Coast Hiawatha. And if I can remember, there's like another train that I'm just blanking on that they also eliminated. And uh, for a time, a section of the radio bound Inter-American ran to Houston to replace this service. And at the time of its cancellation, the Lone Star was actually Amtrak's seventh most used long distance train due to the colleges along the route, um, which is a shame since the route was without service until 1999 when the Heartland Flyer was launched to connect Oklahoma City to Fort Worth. And if I can remember correctly, the reason why um, the cuts happened in 1979, or at least the routes that were cut, it was based on fare box recovery, so ridership didn't matter, and the fact that it was the seventh busiest long distance route in the system was irrelevant to the fact that its fare box recovery was low because, you know, college students like me are mostly going to be using coach, not sleepers. And uh, reasons why you shouldn't plan your public transportation like a business. I mean, Amtrak is, in theory, supposed to be a business, but we damn well don't run it like one and never really have. Anyways, as far as future plans go, I know the... Um, Heartland Flyer might, is at least Oklahoma, is considering maybe adding a few more daily frequencies, possibly extending it up into Kansas City or Wichita. Who really knows at this point, um, given, well, I'm, I'm going to leave like, the contemporary politics of Octo late October 2021 out of it. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll just leave it there. This is the first of the round of Texas-centric videos, well, Dallas-Fort Worth-centric videos. And uh, we'll be getting into this. I believe the next one will be station videos for um, Dallas Union Station and I think Fort Worth Central Station is what they call it now. So those will probably be some of the next videos. Eventually the other videos will get made around Texas. But at time of recording, they're still they're still ideas. They're on a they're on a basically a bullet bulletin board at this point. So I hope you did enjoy and I hope you will come back for the next one. And I also don't ask too much about the YouTube things of like liking, sharing, subscribing, leaving comments, um, all the fun YouTube stuff. So I will see you in the next one and I hope you did enjoy and see ya.